am going to give another talk, um, another of my passions, which is the settlement of space and biological technologies for the settlement of space. Um, I am a project scientist at UC Santa Cruz, at University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and I also run a company called SynBioBeta, which is a conference and news digest for synthetic biology startup companies. I've worked at NASA for the last five years in the synthetic biology program, although the talk that I'm giving tonight is not on my research at NASA, and I'm not representing NASA. I wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of what synthetic biology is, talk about some of the applications of synthetic biology as they relate to space, and talk about some of the resources that are out there in space, which many people don't realize are there. When you do think about space, you really think about this dry, desolate, cold place. It doesn't really inspire you uh, that you could be maybe living there one day, or eating there one day, or sleeping there one day. Uh, and even worse is if you look at humans in space for the last few decades, all you see is people floating around in tin cans, uh, not much better than a caravan or a recreational vehicle in space. Um, but as a race, humans are pretty resilient. As a race, we love to explore. Um, if we take a historical precedent of exploration, and think about resources, and particularly the production of food, there's an unwritten rule amongst sailors that if they find a deserted island, they should leave behind on that deserted island some sheep. And the concept is that for the next sailor that comes behind them, they no longer find a deserted island, but they find an island that has some sheep on it that can then act as food for the next people to come along behind them. And uh, I hope that we can kind of advocate for this in space, that as we explore, we don't just find somewhere and move on, but we find somewhere and leave behind some technology uh, in the terms of synthetic biology, where you have then the capability to produce food or other materials wherever you go in the universe. So uh, the historical context is Prince Henry, the navigator from Portugal. He said um, that, uh, he said to his knight Cabral, set sail towards the setting sun. Uh, and at some point following the discovery of Santa Maria, which is uh, in the Pacific, so in the Atlantic, sheep were let loose on the island before settlement actually took place. There was not much interest among the Portuguese people in an isolated desert island world, hundreds of miles from civilization. But patiently, Cabral gathered resources and settlers for the next three years and set sail to establish colonies on Santa Maria first and then later on San Miguel. So I think this is a pretty good analogy to space at the moment. There's not that much interest uh, in, in humanity in general in these desolate planets uh, far away. But if we can start to show that we can convert the resources there into, uh, into things that people can eat or sleep on or make houses from, then I think we'll uh, start to make an impact on people thinking about settling these, uh, these islands, which is what I'm interested in doing. This is the reason why we haven't settled space so far. This is the, uh, the Falcon from SpaceX. And um, obviously, this is doing a lot of good things for space. But the reason is uh, because the gravity of Earth that's holding us back. It's, it's very, very expensive to send things into space. This is John von Neumann, the father of computer science. And he advocated sending self-replicating machines to the moon because the self-replicating machines could convert the resources that they find on the moon into um, into more self-replicating machines that could then eventually colonize the moon. I'll come back to John von Neumann in, in a second. Um, so part of the problem of gravity is it's, it's uh, extremely expensive to get things up into space. If you think about just water that you get from the tap, this is in the US, uh, a, a glass of water from the tap would cost you about 0 0.0008 cents, so pretty cheap to drink a glass of water. Um, maybe if you got it from a supermarket, it would cost you about 30 cents a liter, or from a vending machine, about 84 cents a liter. Yeah, so um, it all depends on how, one, on how you got it there, or two, how you recycle it. So if we don't have any recycling and we're just sending uh, water into space, then you, you have a number of uh, choices of how to get it there, from the Ariane, about $10,000 a kilogram, to the Atlas V, about $14,000. Uh, the Soyuz, which is currently the best way uh, that the US is getting it there, is about 17,000. 
Um, but now Elon Musk comes along and, and slashes the price in half. It's about $5,000 a kilogram to, uh, to get things up on the Dragon spacecraft at the moment. Um, but that's still, that's still uh, a huge amount of money. If we look at what an astronaut consumes every day, they need about a kilogram of oxygen, um, about 620 grams dried weight of food, of one kilogram of water in the food, about 790 grams of water for food preparation, 1.62 kilograms for drinking. So a total uh, of water and oxygen and food of about five kilograms is needed, you need, if you're gonna be in space to survive per day. If we multiply that by $5,000 a kilogram, it's about $27,000 in consumables that you need uh, to survive in space. That does not include all the water that you might need for washing yourself or your or showering or clothes or your dishes or flushing uh, the toilet, which is about 25 kilograms or about $137,000 per person per day. And there are about six people in space at the moment on the, uh, on the ISS, on the space station. So these numbers are just ridiculous, um, 164,000 in total for the stuff that each person has to send up there. Um, now if you look at the daily outputs, uh, the, the biggest output is uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, which you breathe out a kilogram of every day for every person in space. Where did that carbon dioxide come from before you breathed it out? How did it get up there? Um, so the oxygen that you breathe uh, on the ISS at some point came up to the ISS as water, and then they used electrolysis to split the water and the hydrogen, and uh, they had oxygen in the, in the cabin. Uh, well, where does the carbon dioxide that I breathe out at the moment come from? Any, any other ideas? From sugar. From? Sugar. From sugars, yeah, exactly, from the food that I eat. So I've got a, a whole bunch of carbon stored in, in sugar in the food that I eat, and I consume it, and I breathe in oxygen, and I react the oxygen with the carbon, and I produce water, and I, and I breathe out um, the carbon dioxide. So where does that carbon go now on the, on the International Space Station when I breathe it out? So most of it is vented, actually not most of it, one third of it is vented outside of the ISS just as a waste product. Um, and two thirds of it is reacted with hydrogen, which then produces water, and the water is fed back into the system. So in terms of water, we're pretty self-sufficient. Self-sufficient is a long way. In terms of water on the space station, it's pretty, it's pretty good recycling. About 85% of the water is recycled. Um, so that's, uh, and in terms of the oxygen, you can get oxygen back because you're splitting the water into oxygen and hydrogen with electricity. So the oxygen is pretty good at recycling. The food, we are useless at recycling. We're not recycling any of it at the moment, um, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then some other sources of water, which we are pretty good at recycling. So food is key because we're putting out a kilogram of CO2 every day converting some of it into water and some into methane. But we're venting most of the, all of the methane. If you take a crew of six people and uh, 300 grams of methane per person that's, that's, that's vented, um, the total cost over the year is about $7 million worth of methane that is just vented out the space station at the moment. So there's a huge opportunity for uh, us to think about this carbon and fix it into other things at the moment. So the, the uh, budget for the ISS is $1.5 billion per year, and half of that is spent on rocket uh, sending up and down fuel and food. So here's the other option. Instead of taking all the food from Earth, uh, we could, for example, take a tree from Earth, and uh, the tree's then going to produce food. Or the concept is we could take a seed that grows the tree that then grows the food. Each of these is successively less in the mass that's required to send up to space, so it's successfully cheaper, um, but obviously it's less reliable than just taking the food itself. So just a quick primer on, uh, on biology. Just a reminder that your, each biological cell has DNA in it, and DNA makes proteins, and proteins are the things that maybe are your hair, keratin, or your skin melanin, or a, a 
signal molecule like insulin in your body. Um, cells can make lots of proteins. They can um, replicate, uh, just continue to replicate and produce a lot of proteins. And a cell itself, which makes proteins, can double every 20 minutes. And in 24 hours, a single cell can convert itself into over a billion cells. So going back to the comment from John von Neumann, we have a self-replicating technology here on Earth. It's called biology, it's called the cell. And biology is this really great tool for the job because it's low mass, it's self-replicating, it grows really fast, it can adapt to different conditions around it. Uh, it's really flexible because there are many different types of biological cell around us, and it's a manufacturing technology for making stuff. That's all with regular technology, with regular biology. Uh, now if we think about synthetic biology and what the future holds, this is Craig Venture up on the right. He's demonstrated over the last uh, uh, almost uh, eight years that, um, so six years, that he can rewrite a complete bacterial genome, transfer it from one organism to another and then boot it up again. So many people are seeing now this field of synthetic biology with whole genome synthesis as a new paradigm in biological engineering where you don't tinker around cutting up pieces of DNA, but instead you can rewrite a complete operating system for the cell. And the cost of doing this and the speed of doing this is halving every 18 months. And this is some work by Rob Carson who's been plotting the falling cost of sequencing and synthesis. And so that's what biology, or that's what synthetic biology is. It's now, how do we turn this new capability of rewriting genomes into an engineering discipline where it's a, easy to rewrite a genome? At the moment, we don't really know how to do it, and we don't really know what the genome says. But with this new plant capability, we're going to be able to do that, we hope. Um, and there are two approaches. Some people, from the science perspective, like Richard Feynman says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Typical uh, kind of scientific uh, viewpoint in trying to uh, build things from understanding them. The second is Tom Knight at MIT who says that the engineering of biology remains complex because we've never made it simple. So there are these two kind of uh, views from science and engineering which make up the field of synthetic biology. So, what could we do for synthetic biology in space, taking us back to now the application? Craig Bender says that over the next 20 years, synthetic genomics is going to become the standard. For making anything. So I think uh, that's the answer in terms of what we could be doing, what are the applications. If you look around us and think of wood, if you look around us and think of cotton, if you look around us and think of poo, all of these things that are going to make life in space much more comfortable uh, already are produced from natural biology. Um, let's think about making everything that we need in space from the resources, from the resources that we find there, but through synthetic biology. This is a chart which, uh, along this axis, shows the max of the system that you're producing the technology, and on the x-axis, it shows the duration of the mission uh, in space. A non-regenerable life support system, let's imagine we're on a space station, um, has a very uh, has a low max, but once the resources are used up, once you've eaten all the food, the mission stops. So the mission is pretty short, but the max is. If we move up along the rung and we are uh, just recovering the water, which is what we're doing at the moment, um, so we're doing water and, and oxygen at the moment, uh, you see the lines start to flatten out. It means that the technology that you're developing is, is more massive. It's taking a lot more mass to create the technology, but the mission duration is really increasing. And so what we're aiming for would be great as a completely closed loop system. Where you hit your mass, it's, it's pretty massive to get it up there. But you can completely close the loop in terms of recycling food and oxygen and water. Here is a vision of um, how we might do this if we did it on the moon. We could have rovers which are roving around looking for resources on the moon. We could have a crater where you can use solar energy to volatilize the lunar ice, the carbon dioxide and the water. 
you could have a bioreactor which is storing the uh, cells, the organisms that are making food or biomaterials, and you're transferring between the place where you found it and the place where it's being made and the place where it's being stored. So let's imagine that this is food. Uh, and you've also got a traditional mining infrastructure on the moon as well. Uh, now let's imagine that you want to switch this and instead of making food, you want to make a drug in there. So you can beam from the earth to your bioreactor on the moon the new genetic code for your organism to make the drug instead of making the food. And instead of zeros and ones, or a lot of zeros and ones, you code it in that. It's a new genetic sequence that you've designed. So this is not completely science fiction. If you look at the recent results from the last three years in terms of lunar science, there is over 600 million tons of water ice at the lunar south pole. So we used to think that the moon was this dry, desolate place. Now we see that there's actually a huge amount of ice there. And in that ice is uh, not just water, but also 0.4% carbon-containing molecules. There's also a lot, 5.6% by mass of water. So with the moon has the resources that we need, we just don't have the technology yet to convert it into better products. Here's one of the products that we could produce. It's called spirulina. You may have seen it in health food stores. This is it growing in huge lakes in Hawaii. It's a complete protein source containing all the essential amino acids. We produced a study um, last year for that exact um, image of what we could do on the moon. And we took the figure of 682 grams per person per day, which is what an astronaut needs in terms of dry weight. And we excavated uh, 12 tons of lunar regolith at about 1,000 kilograms every 30 minutes, which is what the uh, lunar robotics competition uh, winner was able to do. So this has been demonstrated on a regolith simulator. Um, out of that, you would get 14 kilograms of CO2 and uh, 682 liters of water. You feed that CO2 and water into your reactor, and every four days the batch reactor will spit out enough food for four people. And it could use solar energy or it could use a nuclear reactor. So we've worked out this complete example of how you could use biotechnology for food production using the resources that we have on the moon. And you could also think about using waste products from the space station. You could also think about demonstrating this on small satellites here with biological payloads, which is something I know some of you are working on. And you could think about some sort of orbital system for the production of food, not on the space station, but actually in orbit. Uh, where would you get those resources from? If people are familiar with Shackleton Energy Company, this is one of the companies that is planning to excavate ice from uh, the moon and ship it into orbit and to have these um, storage depots for oxygen, hydrogen, and water in low Earth orbit so that you can reach escape velocity, orbit the Earth, and then refuel on, on oxygen uh, or hydrogen to a fuel source. What we said was, well, in this, oxygen, in this regolith that you're launching from Earth, you're also going to find CO2 inside of it. So maybe we can have some sort of infrastructure for producing food in orbit as well so that you can start to not only recycle the food, but actually produce food from scratch. And then when Elon is passing in the Dragon capsule on his way to Mars, he can stop off and pick up some, uh, some high protein content shake. Um, I'm now going to move away from food, because although it's a really good example, it's a pretty boring example of being that's one of the things that you want to use synthetic biology for. I think there's a lot more exciting examples. If you look at a seed from a, from a pine tree or a redwood tree, Inside this seed, it contains all of the genetic information needed to, uh, to grow this structure. Now, we don't yet know how to control it, but imagine if we could rewrite this genome to grow the tree into a giant house or some giant underground root system that you could live in. At the moment, we have no idea the natural mechanisms for structural prediction and morphology. But with this rapid advance in the ability to engineer genomes, I hope that one day we'll be able to and it's not just trees that have these amazing structures. Uh, if you look anywhere in nature, you can see these, uh, these wonderful morphologies that nature has evolved. And we have no idea how to engineer these at the moment. But the 
division is that we will be one day. And it's not just plants. If you look uh, around at things like shell and bone, teeth, these are really hard radiation resistant building materials. Um, but again, we don't know how nature produces them, but at some point through synthetic biology, we may be able to produce them ourselves. Now, I showed this uh, in the other talk yesterday. So for people who, anyone new who didn't see it, does anyone, can anyone guess what this is? So this is uh, this is the purple. It's a false color image, but the purple is spider silk uh, coming out of the uh, spinnerets of the spider. So another amazing natural material, a natural um, biological material um, that can now be engineered. And you can see spider silk monomers. These are individual proteins of uh, spider silk which are coming out of here. Uh, there's a company in San Francisco that's now making bacteria with the genes from the spider silk. So that the bacteria now produces spider silk in a fermenter, just like you might produce alcohol. Um, so I think it's a it's a great example of amazing uh, production potential for biological materials. And it's really important because it's a growing field. If you look at the U.S. bioeconomy's genetically modified products, it's about three hundred billion dollars or two percent of GDP. So the, our economy on Earth is shifting towards biological production. So logical that any economy in space is going to be the same. And with that, I will leave you with, uh, with Prince Henry the Navigator and uh, wish you well on setting sail towards uh, settling the solar system, but hope that you remember to, to uh, not just think about the physical, chemical, thermal technology and it's okay to buy a